Hey everybody and welcome back to the Pole Vault Project. I'm your host Daniel Turvey. We are here today with Katerina Stefaniti, uh, the fantastic pole vaulter, um, to go over a few of her highlights. Uh, she, in 2012, uh, was the Pac-12 champion, the NCAA champion, and went to the Olympics all in 2012. That was a big year. Uh, she's the Greek national record holder, the Stanford school record holder, uh, was the world youth champion in 2005, took second there in 2007 and third in 2008. She was the 2014 uh, silver medalist at the European Championships um, and took silver uh, at the indoor European Championships in 2015. Um, Kat, thank you so much for joining us. It's awesome to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Okay, so I guess to get started, um, obviously you've been, you know, as a world youth champion, you've been jumping for a long time. And since you were, you're really young, I think people would love to hear the story of kind of how you got into pole vault and what it's been like jumping from such a young age. Yeah, so it's actually not that unusual in Europe to start from such a young age. I started vaulting when I was 10 years old. Uh, both my parents did track and field, my dad triple jumped, and my mom did the 400. So I had a little bit of everything in there. And um, as a kid, I did a lot of sports, but um, I would just never stick with something for training. And pole vaulting was the first thing that had enough variety that would just keep me in it. And so I started doing it. And then luckily, as a young kid at 11, I started breaking some age group records. So of course, when you start being successful, you just want to keep doing it. And that's how I kept doing it after 11 and 12 years old. And then from there, like you said, I went to World Youth and it got me a scholarship at Stanford and it's been a long ride. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um... And then I'm, I'm sure you've learned an incredible amount <laughs> throughout, throughout your journey as a pole vaulter. Um, if you could kind of rewind the clock and go back and start over again from such a young age, you know, knowing what you know now, is there anything that you would tweak or do differently or any advice that you'd give yourself at that age? You know, I, I would say I was pretty lucky as a kid. I had a coach that was very good in like the technical aspect of the event. So when I went in, I was pretty fast, a pretty strong kid, you know, at 10 years old, as fast and strong as you can be. And I was very lucky that that coach uh, told me, okay, you're fast, you're strong, you're a good athlete, let's make you a good pole vaulter. And I literally spent the next two years trying to be a good pole vaulter. We didn't lift, we didn't do too much gymnastics. We did what we call in Europe exercises that mimic a position. Uh, so clearly you can only get 30 jumps in at a pole vault session, but you can get 300 drill, drills in. So we did so many drills my first few years and they actually didn't let me bend the pole for a couple of years too. So I would just straight pole and that, I have to say so many good things about straight pulling. It teaches you so much about the physics of the event. Um, so I wouldn't say I would change too much. There was definitely some points I'd say that the Europeans take the technique part a little too far and forget about the speed and the power. But I was lucky enough to come to the US where the other extreme exists where you forget a little bit about the technique and just focus too much on the speed and power. And I think now after so many years of doing one and then so many years of doing the other, I have found a good balance. Uh, so I wouldn't say it would change too much because I think when you're younger, it's better to learn to become a good pole vaulter and the speed and power are easier and they will come. They will come in college. You always get good strength coaches in college. So I think if anything, focus on becoming a better technical pole vaulter and then you can put the power in it. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think it's really interesting to hear about how different people, you know, everyone kind of arrives at the same point of you have to be good at the technique and you have to be good at the, you know, the speed and the power part and be a good athlete. And it doesn't, you know, clearly it works different ways for different people. And for you, you focus so much on the technique early on so that when you went to college and you were ready to add in the speed and the power, you already had the technique there. Yeah. And you know, the reason I say that I'm sure it can work another way where you're strong and fast and you just work really hard to learn the technique, but 
in my opinion, when you have developed bad habits over the years, and especially when you have gotten strength and power with bad habits, it's a lot harder to change them. And that's why I say focus on becoming a better pole vaulter, because it's a lot easier to fix it when you're still young and you don't have those bad habits. And then you can put the power and the strength so much faster and so much easier on the right positions than the other way around. I'm sure it has worked for other people the other way around, but I think it's a lot harder. And more inefficient, if anything. <laughs> yeah, and I think it, it's probably safer too to be better at the technique first. Like I remember way back when I was in high school, there was a kid who, when he was a senior, started trying pole vault, and he, so he was already a phenomenal athlete from doing. I think he was a long jumper and a sprinter, and then he was just all over the place pole vaulting. Where if you're not as good of an athlete, you're all over the place, but you're not high up enough to really injure yourself. Whereas this guy was like flying everywhere. So focusing on the technique first is, could be better and it's safer. And Definitely. why not learn to be a better pole vaulter first? Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Um, you also mentioned that you did uh, like a ton of drills and you mentioned straight pole drills um, were a huge part of your early training. Are there any other drills? Uh, I know this maybe isn't the best format to talk know. about, you know, really know. technical stuff. Um, you know, like I said, when I was young, we did very many drills, like with the, the what do we call it, the plan box. We had built our own, like in Greece, you can imagine, like a wooden uh, plan box where we would just push it. And there were so many drills of moving your hand from from your hip all the way through to the right positions. We had this, like, we called it the slap drill, where we would literally slap the wall so that you start expecting the hit when you hit the box. We did so many drills. There were days that I would go to practice and we would do four hours of drills. We would do nothing else, just four hours of drills. And you might think it's easy and you just repeat the same motion over and over again, but it's repetition that counts. And when you can only take 30 jumps, but do this motion 300 times, you would learn it better doing that than jumping for 30 times. Of course, it needs to translate into the jumping, but I think when you do it so many times, it gets so ingrained that it will translate into the jumping. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, I think maybe like an analogy for people would be like, if you're playing baseball, like you can be up there at the plate with someone throwing a ball at you and like you like in a game or in like a practice where the whole team's there, but you can only do so many of those before either you get exhausted or you're taking up too much of everyone else's time. But like you can sit there in your backyard and just swing a bat hundreds and hundreds of times and you'll get better at it eventually just from repetition. Yeah. Yes, that's a perfect example. My my husband actually, he pole vaults. He used to play baseball in high school. And he always says that, I don't understand why in baseball it's such a big thing to do what you said. Just go in your backyard and swing and just do it 300 times a night, you know, versus in pole vault. In Europe, it's a big thing. But here, I feel like I've seen it so much less where... I mean, of course, the fun part of pole vaulting is pole vaulting, you know, you want to pole vault. But I think when, when you want to be better, you need to stop worrying about the pole vaulting part itself and the having fun. And you need to have fun. And of course, you are going to pole vault, but you definitely need to include those things in the training. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm sure also competing from such a young age, competing is almost second nature to you. And, you know, like going to a meet, for a lot of people can be very stressful, but for you, I imagine it doesn't phase you as much again, cause you've just practiced competing so much. Um, do you have any advice for people or kind of like lessons you've learned or something about how to mentally approach competitions? Um, yes and no. I would say, I think this is a little bit innate, like from the very first meet I ever did, I was very competitive. I focused on the right way and I focus not on being aggressive in terms of, oh, I'll run as fast as I can down the runway, but to do the right things. So I think that's something that your coach teaches you a little bit, but I think it's something that you either have or you don't have. Like you see people that just choke and you see people that tend to do better at championships all the time. But as I grew up and I kept doing pretty good at championships, I realized that 
the most important thing is to trust your training and when you go in the meet you can think about where is my hand and where's my leg and is my foot hitting under my hip and is this happening you have to know that you took 300 jumps in the last month uh, in practice and that's where you worked and stuff and now you're at the meet and you have to turn your brain off because sadly it's a very mental support you have to completely turn your brain on and trust that you've learned what you need to do you know how to do it um, so I think the last few years, um, that has really helped me and it has helped me not worry too much about getting on a bigger pole or a bigger grip. Like I know that I'm doing the right thing. I know I've done it for so long and I don't know how to do it right. So I don't think to over, I don't need to overthink it at a meet. And I would say meat wise, that's the best advice I can give. Awesome. I think that's fantastic advice. Learning how to turn your brain off and just, yeah fall back on your training, do what you've been training to do. I think that's awesome advice. Um, and then I guess probably it, it takes a lot to keep training at such a high level for so many years as well. Is there, uh, yeah, I guess, how do you, how do you approach your training, uh, like mentally and emotionally that because you've been training for so long? You know, I gave you two completely different answers in this. Um, I've definitely thought about quitting many times. You know, pole vault is a very frustrating sport. I jumped 14-4 in high school, in fact, as a freshman in high school, and then didn't PR again until I was a junior in college. So that's, I think, seven years right there. So you can imagine how frustrating that can be. Um, but I think, like, I think it gives you respect for the sport, the respect for your teammates, the respect for your competitors. And I think that's kind of what gives me the power every morning to get up and go to practice again. And, um, and now the second part of the answer I'll say is that I have been very fortunate to have had very different coaches over the years. Like I was saying earlier, like I grew up with a very European approach to pole vaulting and I went into a very American approach so to pole vaulting in college, and I think I have found a balance now. And I think every day you learn something new, every meet, every failure, every success, you learn something new that gets you excited to go to practice next time and try that new thing or know that, oh, what I'm doing now is so much better than I was doing last year. So it just gives you this motivation. So again, like I said, two different answers. Like... I've definitely not wanting to go to practice before and dreaded it. And, but I think learning to have fun with it, and maybe I should say this is my answer to your question. I think you can wait until you're successful to enjoy it and have fun with it. You need to first love it, have fun with it, know that you pole vault because you love it and you have fun with it, know that you train every day because you just like it. And I think that will make you successful versus the other way around. So I think that's how I approach training every day. Sometimes I go and jump 16 feet and sometimes I go and jump 14 feet. But I would like to say that I enjoy both days just as much. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it takes a lot of character and experience to get to that point where you can enjoy practice you know, when you're doing well and when you're not doing well. Um, there's a, a weightlifting coach that I, that I follow online named John Bros, and he talks about how every day that you go into the gym and touch the bar, it's a plus, and every day that you don't, it's a minus. Yeah. So, like, even if you go in and you have a terrible day and you're just lifting the bar, it's still a plus, you know, and to kind of – I think that's a similar idea of, like, even if you're not jumping well, you're doing it because you enjoy it. Exactly. Yeah. You have to love it first and it has to make you happy before it makes you successful. I think happiness comes before the success. Yeah. And then the success I assume is, is kind of a new kind of happiness or adds to the happiness. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm just, all I'm saying is you can't wait to be successful, to love it. And I think it, like I said earlier, when I was younger, I was successful, so I wanted to keep doing it. And I think that's the other way around. It should be that you, and I think I just grew to love it more and to understand it more, to appreciate it more. And now I think I'm, I'm doing it the right way versus eight years ago where I just wanted to do it because it just happened to be what I'm good at. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Is there... Any advice that you have for people on the topic of nutrition? Because I'm sure 
training from such a young age, when you're young, you can kind of eat anything and you yes. just keep training and keep getting better. And then, you know, somewhere around your late teens or early twenties, that starts to change and you kind of have to pay attention. Um, yeah. So yeah, do you have any advice for people there? Yeah, in fact, I had a big issue with that around 16 years old after I won World Youth Championships. I started gaining a little bit of weight, you know, becoming a woman from a girl. And at the time, my coach and my dad freaked out about it. I had literally gained three pounds. So I'm not talking about like getting fat. I'm talking about I had gained three pounds. And my coach and my dad at the time freaked out and we went to all these nutritionists and dietitians and I just kept gaining weight because I was obsessing about it. And I think one, my first advice is just let your body do what it's doing. I think you might go through a phase where you're eating exactly the same and you're bigger. You might just go through that phase. You're, you're going through puberty in high school, especially for women, it's hard. Um, Especially for women, again, I'd say, don't ever like let anybody tell you that you should eat less. I think that's the biggest mistake girls in high school do. They start reducing what they eat and reducing what they eat. And of course, at some point, you want to eat a little bit of what you like. So then they end up eating dessert because they get to eat two meals a day. So they eat two bad meals a day. So they don't get the nutrition they need in. And the two meals they eat are bad. So it's just like one on top of the other, on top of the other. And I, the last couple of years, I realized that I can eat literally twice as much and be, I, I'm the fittest I've ever been in eight years probably since high school. And I eat twice as much, but I eat right. And eating right makes me not, want, not crave things. And I think like, it's not so much the kind of nutrition that you probably were expecting me to say, oh, I take a multivitamin and I take a B complex. Like I do, I take a B complex, but I don't think that does anything. Um, I think giving your body the right nutrition during the day, especially is what makes you not crave things the next day or at night or two days later. And I think that keeps you at a healthier weight and it keeps you healthier muscle wise too. Absolutely. I think that's fantastic advice. You know, I think eating well and eating for performance and eating for happiness and eating to, you know, look good and feel good is all the same thing. And not eating is not the solution to any of those things. No, it doesn't. It, it will hurt you muscle wise as an athlete and it will hurt you as a person. Like, I think it hurts people mentally, it hurts people emotionally. Like, I think I wish. I, and I don't know, maybe in the US there is like a mandatory class you have to take in high school about nutrition, but especially for females, I think they should make it so that they have to take this class and understand that not eating is not going to get you any thinner. Eating is going to get you thinner, but eating right, of course. Um, I think it's very, it's just such a hard time, high school for girls and getting bigger. And I had the hardest time, I'm telling you, I, I gained all of the freshmen 15 plus 15 more as a freshman in college and i was already big at the time going to college so it was just a terrible experience but like i said eight years later i'm learning <laughs> absolutely and it's always a journey right you yeah. never stop like you're saying about you know what makes you excited to go to practice every day is you always are learning something new that you want to take to try out of practice and nutrition's the same way you know, Definitely. you try, try new things, try different, you know, a little bit more of this, a little bit less of this and see what works for you and what feels the best. And Definitely. And your body constantly changes too, I think. Like, I think there was a time that I could eat no meat literally for weeks and I'd feel fine. And there's times that I'm craving meat all the time. And I think maybe depending on the training at the time of the year and just like the work growing we're becoming from girls to women to older women and uh, the body changes and it craves and needs different things absolutely um and then one of the other big parts of training that's been really important for me since getting out of college is like the rest and recovery component and starting to take that much more seriously um i'm sure you know having uh, very successful athletes as parents and competing from a young age, a lot of those kind of rest and recovery habits were taught to you. They're almost second nature. Um, but yeah, I guess, do you have any advice for people on, on how to recover between workouts? Um, yeah. So 
Again, I think different athletes are different when it comes to that. I, For example, my husband, he thinks that stretching hurts him. Doesn't make too much sense to me physiologically, but he thinks that maybe, and maybe he does, maybe he pushes the stretch too much and it could hurt you when you're pushing it too much. So I think that's one of those things, again, that you have to kind of learn yourself, learn your body, and it's, it is going to change over the years too. There was a time where... I will never get injured and never take care of myself. And it was perfect. I wish I could be there again. But for me, once you hit, once I hit 23, something happened. I don't know. Suddenly I started getting injured. But I think you start learning what you need to do. And most of us, I'd say, have weaknesses that don't really change over the years. Like for me, I have some hip weaknesses. So I know that once I'm starting to hurt, I need to do some hip flexor stretching, some taking care of that area. For other people, it's their calves. For pole vaulters, I'd say. Um, so I think for everybody, it's a little bit different. But I would say the minimum the minimum you can do is once a month go in and just get a full body massage, even if it's a short one. I think just going through it, maybe you're not hurting somewhere, but somebody else telling you that, you know what, your hamstring is a little tight, you should watch out. It just kind of like gives you a heads up. And a lot of times I think we get used to all those tightnesses and we don't pay attention to them. And I think it's nice to hear it from somebody else and, I think maybe that way you prevent something from happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I think especially for people at the college level, a lot of colleges have athletic trainers and people that you can go to that that's what they're there for is to work on you and, you know, explore your tissues and go, Hey, this should move more than it's moving, or this shouldn't feel like this. This shouldn't be really painful to push on. So yeah, definitely. And I guess like the one advice I'll tell people, in college, we iced all the time. Ice baths, ice, this thing called game ready that we used to do that was just iced water, I think. I have come to realize that ice helps when there is an inflammation and you want to, blood to get out. But most of the times, we want blood to come to the injured muscle or to the area. So I would say for probably 90% of injuries i would recommend heating it and not icing it and people might want to kill me for saying that but i really like i i i'm a nerd i went to stanford and i read a lot and i read new research coming out and i really do believe in the new research saying that ice can actually hurt you more it i think it really does slow down the healing process and i think heating has really helped me a lot more than icing has Absolutely. I'm 100% on board with that. Um, there's a, a guy, another guy that I follow named Kelly Starrett, who um, I haven't looked through all the research, so I can't say for 100% certainty that this claim is true, but his claim is that there's no research that supports that icing reduces injuries or helps prevent injuries or anything like that. It just numbs it and makes it feel better in the minute, and then you stop icing and everything goes back to exactly how it was before you were yep. icing. Yep. Yeah. Excellent advice. Um, and then uh, I, my next question is about coaching. So you grew up in Europe and had, like you were saying, very European style coaches and then came over here to the US and uh, you know had a, a US style coach. Um, so you've had a lot of different coaches. Um, I would love to get your, your thoughts and opinions on like the importance of coaching and different coaching styles. And yeah, all the different coaches that you've worked with. Yeah, so I think the number one thing before what you do for training and what you do technically and how much knowledge your coach has, I think the number one and most important thing is their attitude because they can say one sentence that will destroy the rest of your season, probably unconsciously, and you have no idea, but my my Greek coach in fact, he used to say, I would go up a pole and I would take off and I would have no conscious fear of it. And he would tell me, oh, you slow it out down at the end. You must be scared of the pole. And then suddenly I'll be scared of the pole. So I, I think that a coach that just gives positive feedback and thinks everything before he says it out loud, uh, I think it's mo- more important than knowing technique and knowing how to train somebody correctly. Now, going to how to train somebody correctly, I think, again, there's so m- especially in the pole vault of all events in track and field, there's so many different ways that somebody can jump high. 
I think they're safer and better ways, but I, we've seen people do it in every single way possible. Uh, so I think the second most important thing in terms of coaching is for the coach to be adaptable. Me, that I grew up learning how to, to jump under the, the petrol for the Russian model, or whatever you want to call it, cannot be doing the same things as somebody who doesn't know how to jump quite as well or jumps very different technically and has a different so i think being adaptable people should not be doing the same things somebody might be really fast and need to work on their technique and somebody might be really slow and be good technically and they need to work on their speed and i think that's the one issue i have with college programs is that everybody's doing the same workout how is everybody doing the same workout like it, it just doesn't make sense even even if we all had the same issue and we all needed to get faster, the way I'll get faster is not the same way that you will get faster. You might need to run 200s and I might need to run 30s. So you, I think there needs to be more personalization when it comes to training at every level, from high school to college to elite and masters. <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree with you there. And I think that's you know one of the maybe slightly ulterior motives of me doing this project is I think that that individualization and personalization of training kind of has to come from the athletes knowing what it is that they need to work on and have like really taking ownership and having a good understanding of themselves and their bodies. And, you know, because a college coach has what 50 athletes yeah. on a team or, you know, if it's 10 pole vaulters, that's, that's a big team of people to, you know, be able to give really, really personalized, specific training to every single person. So I think some of that has to come from the athlete. So, yeah, definitely. And one thing I've been told is that, and I like it as an idea, is that when you're younger, when you're in high school, 20% of what happens is your fault and 80% is your coach's fault. But as you keep getting older, this percentage changes to the point where it's a hundred percent your fault when you're in your later 20s you know and not of your coaches or maybe 10 to 90 percent and i know that that probably doesn't help all the high school kids that are watching this because it is i i really think that in high school you really need to trust your coach and i think trusting what you're doing is more important than whether you're doing the right thing, especially at that age. But as you grow older and you want to become an elite vaulter, I think you need to start realizing what works for you, what doesn't, and be vocal about it with your coach as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think in high school, like like you were saying, like you're just, you're physically getting bigger. You're just getting stronger, like just run, do anything. You can't yeah. help but get <laughs> faster and stronger. And if you practice pole vaulting, you're gonna get better at it. So. I think that, you know, I think you, you raise an excellent point there. Just trust your coach. It's a lot easier to get better very quickly when you're in high school. And then as you get into college and onto the elite level, you really have to start to figure out like what works for me. How do I get the most bang for my buck from my training? Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and then I wanted to ask a little bit about, a bit about teammates. Um, jumping all over the world. I'm sure you've jumped with a bunch of different people. And I think... Um, you know, for, for say someone that's at the high school level and they're jumping really well and they're the only person at their school or the only person in their conference who's jumping, you know, 14 or 15 feet yeah. on the guy side and, you know, 13 or 14 on the girl side, it's, it can be tough to like really want to push and continue to improve when you don't have people around you that are pushing you to jump a lot higher. So I, I would love to hear your, your thoughts and opinions on, you know, teammates and training partners. You know, it is tough, and I felt a little bit that way at some point when I was younger in Greece. I would be jumping 13.6, and the second best uh, girl in my age group would be jumping 11.6. Uh, so it felt a little bit like you're saying, like, I won with 12 feet. Why do I need to jump 13, you know? But um, I would say, number one, you need to be more inner motivated like I, I i and i'm the worst in this actually i if i can win by one centimeter i will not jump a single centimeter higher than that uh and i'm really bad at it but i 
I'm working on it. And I think you need to be motivated about getting better yourself. And it has nothing to do with what everybody is jumping. And that comes for that that comes to say for the people that are not as good too. You know, what if you're three feet jumping three feet lower than everybody else? Like if you're just loving it and you're enjoying it, keep doing it. Every inch you jump higher, the better. You know, but. I have been lucky even at that young age. I had older teammates with me. Uh, so I always have somebody to push me. And in college, I was the best girl, I'd say, on the team, polvo wise, but I was not a good athlete. So at the time, we would train with the long jumpers and triple jumpers, and I would be the last one to cross the finish line every time. So I think you can always find a way to get yourself better, even if that's not exactly at pole vaulting. I think you can find ways of improving and becoming a better athlete. And I think if, if there is somebody like what you're describing, where they're just jumping the highest in the whole state, you know, and they don't have anybody else, I think I'm sure they can find a club in the area where they can probably go to once a week, once a month, depending on how affordable it is. And I'm sure they can find somebody that can push them either mentally or physically or just jumping higher you know so i think there if if somebody comes to a point like that there's definitely solutions to it but teammates have been very important for me in my life i i was 12 years old and everybody in my group was 25 and so i was just like everybody's a little sister and i i just loved it at the time and then go i love i I would never play a team sport in the sense of it, you know, basketball or volleyball, but I love the feeling of the team. It was like my favorite time when I was at Stanford and I felt like part of the team. And when I performed well, the team got points and that was like the best feeling for me. And I do miss it a little bit now. And when I, I moved to Arizona to train there for a couple of years, I loved going back to this environment where it was a club and yeah, we were in a team and we weren't all getting points together, but we all got excited for one another. And I definitely miss that feeling a little bit, but I think at some point track and pole vault, it's, it's, it's an individual event and you have to find ways to better yourself without needing to have other people to push you. Awesome. Thank you. I think that's a, a, a really nice mix of having teammates to push you and not needing teammates to push you because you do have that kind of intrinsic motivation. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share or talk about? Is there anything I missed? Um, I don't know. I mean, we talked a little bit about the mental part of pole vaulting, uh, I think, and I've realized over the years and it, it was part of what I said with the example with the coach. I think the most important thing is to be confident. Sometimes I've seen people be overconfident and I think it can hurt you and be unsafe in some ways. But I would, if I were a coach, I would rather have somebody be overconfident and they get hurt because they were overconfident than somebody be tentative and not trusting themselves and i think you can get if you're going to get hurt one way or the other i would rather them get hurt by being overconfident and i think being overconfident or confident i shouldn't use the word overconfident i think it it just helps you grow it helps you set goals that might seem unrealistic for some people but you end up reaching them and i wasn't like that i always used to say i need to be realistic i need to be realistic about my goals and i need to set goals that i can actually reach so that i don't get upset at the end of the year and i think i always just set goals that were a little low so that i can reach them and it was nice and i did most of the time but you can't realize that you just need to push yourself in that way you need to push yourself in you know, all of us have our big pole, the pole that, oh, I'm getting my big pole now. And you need to push yourself and stop thinking that that's your big pole and think that the next pole is your big pole. And I think we do it with heights. I think we do it with poles. I think we do it with grip. And I think we all need that confidence that sadly doesn't just come from us and it comes from the people around us too. So I would say that's one advice. The people you surround yourself with is very important. And it's not just, your teammates and your coaches is everybody's your physios your chiropractor your it's just everybody that has even a little bit of input into your pole vault career 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, where can people go to find you, follow you and, you know, support your, your career and your endeavors? So I have a professional Facebook page. Uh, Katerina Stefanidi is it. Um, I'm terrible at Twitter. Uh, I don't really update it very much, but uh, my uh, name there is Kat Stephanie. If you want to follow me, I try my best with Twitter. I just, I just don't get it. I don't know why. And then Instagram, um, I believe it's I Vault Cat. Uh, and so you can follow me there. I recently got an Instagram, so I'm trying to figure that out as well. I, I'm best with Facebook, I'd say, but I try all around. It's just hard because sometimes I'm like, what am I doing? I need to concentrate on training. I don't need to be posting pictures and videos, but I think it's important, in, especially at this point of, you know, that's what we do. Social media is what we do at this point, so I try hard. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. And uh, are there any uh, sponsors that you want to want to give a shout out to? Yeah, I would love to thank Nike. They have supported me pretty at the beginning of my post collegiate career. And then UCS Spirit, they make the best balls. Granted, I've really not jumped on many other balls, but <laughs> um, they really have supported me actually throughout college that we, we were jumping on UCSs at Stanford. And then after college, they've been great to me, uh, and I would like to thank them. And then there is uh, this Greek company called Stichimon. I don't know if anybody would really benefit from this, but uh, they've been great. They It's actually what we call in Greece an Olympic sponsorship, so it usually comes a year or two before the Olympics, and they're doing a great job. They're really helping a lot of Greek Olympians, and I would like to thank them as well. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us on the show and sharing your, uh, your wonderful advice and experience with everyone. Yeah, um, awesome. Thank you, you for having me. That was fun. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for anyone that's watching this, um, if you have any questions, uh, if you have people that you want to hear from, uh, you can email me at thepolevoltproject at gmail.com or uh, Facebook or Instagram, however you, you want to get a hold of me. I would love to get your questions answered. That's the whole point of this project. Um, Kat, thank you so much. And uh, we will see everyone next time on the next episode of The Pole Vault Project. Thank you.